good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the afternoon sessions of Gateway uh, X uh, for the NMRA uh, X. Uh, Our next uh, speaker is going to, he's the current uh, vice president of the British region, and he models uh, Great Northern through the Cascades. So not exactly in Britain, but a good railroad nonetheless. Uh, he's also principal oboe at the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra and senior tutor of oboe at the Northern or the Royal Northern College of Music in Manchester, England. And uh, welcome to Mr. Jonathan Small, who is going to talk to us about end scale trees. Uh, take it away, Jonathan. Thank you, Bruce. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, or good morning, good, good evening, wherever we are. Um, it's great to be with you. Um, thanks for that lovely introduction. Um, you might uh, wonder why, you know, uh, I guess we all model um, uh, our favorite railroads and, and we pick them for various different reasons. I'm, I wanted to start my talk just by talking briefly a little bit about how I got into American model railroading. I'm sure it's a, um, an experience many of us have shared, uh, particularly in the UK. Why would you model American trains? Well, American trains speak for themselves, don't they? The, the, the beauty of them, the color of them. I was very fortunate. My school... Um, my headmaster, Cliff Young, who I was uh, an NMRA member in his time in Northeast London, modeled the Denver Rio Grande. He'd never been to the United States. He never visited Colorado. I think he'd have liked to. But during the war, he was uh, in the Royal Air Force and he met American servicemen who um, introduced him to uh, photographs of uh, Denver Rio Grande um, consolidations and other steam locomotives. And he just fell in love with the sight of them. And modeled them ever since in, in HO scale. And I was very fortunate to visit his layout, which became quite legendary in the UK. It was um, featured in a number of publications, in, in books and magazines, and I saw many photographs and, and diagrams of it uh, in, in, during my youth. And I kind of fell in love with the whole concept of, of American trains, but didn't have a handle on it until I met my wife, who is from Maryland, uh, and her father, my late father-in-law, who modeled at American end scale, and well, the rest, as they say, is history. Um, how, choosing a railroad, well, I guess I was a little bit of influence from Cliff uh, because uh, Rio Grande, of course, from Denver, his layout was Denver up to the Moffat Tunnel, the, uh, the, the wonderful line up the front range. And um, I, I kind of just liked the concept of going from, from a city, a populated area, up through various small towns to a major tunnel through the, the, the mountain range. And so I, I guess subconsciously I sought another location where that was the case and I found the Cascades. And I also fell in love with the, I fell in love with many things, didn't I? <laughs> with the, uh, the Great Northern, partly for the, uh, the, the beauty and efficiency of, of the railway, but also of course the color scheme, the post-war Omaha orange and Pullman green color scheme was just very, very appealing. Um, of course, that involves mountain scenery, and well, I'm a great lover of mountains. Uh, one of my other uh, pursuits is to climb, uh, well, we, we call it hill walking in the UK. There's a difference in the UK and the US particularly, where you, you, have, you go trail hiking there, I believe, except for the serious guys who climb mountains. Uh, here in the UK, we, we often do hill walking because our mountains aren't quite so high, and you can get up and down in a day. So I, that's one of my pursuits, and I go to Scotland regularly where of course there's very beautiful mountain scenery. And, and I think as you'll see when I share with some of my photos with you that um, the uh, scenery ha bears a, a number of resemblances, uh, particularly since the introduction and planting of a lot of coniferous areas uh, in, in Scotland in the last hundred years or so. So I chose um, the Great Northern in the Cascades and Stevens Pass uh, has its similarities to the, the Scottish um, mountain size, as I say. So I'm going to go into my clinic now and start to share um, the slides that I have. Start from beginning and sorry, I'll, I'll just share. I'll, I've got to share this. Hang on a sec. I will get there. There we go. Share screen from beginning. There we go. Uh, hopefully you can all see that. So um, trees from a still be flowers. Now this this clinic has been titled Trees in end scale, but actually, uh, just hang on, Jonathan. We've got a blank uh, screen for me there, so we need to uh, do something okay, else. We need to fix that. Sorry, uh, Bruce. Sorry, everyone. Um, well, I'm trying to share the what am I doing wrong here? You want to share the application tab? Yeah, I've got that. It's ah, uh, it says it's not responding. Oh no, 
we're having our fun today, aren't we? Uh, it's challenging to say the least, isn't it? Uh -oh, uh, it? Oh, it's not NMRX without a few technical difficulties. <laughs> uh, if you just escape out of your um, slideshow that you were presenting and go through it the way that you did it before, and you'll be fine. So just stop sharing. Um, first thing. Um, I've got uh, Gordy. I've got um, Google Chrome not responding apparently. Um, but ah. I'll have to go out and come back into the talk. Yep, that's okay. We'll be fine. Okay, close the program. All right. We're having loads of fun today. Oh, come on. <laughs> Don't worry about it. So, honestly, it's fine. So what's the weather like in Orkney today, Gordy? Lovely. Light breeze, you know. What light would be, light, light breeze only 60 miles an hour? Coast. Yeah, 60 miles no, an hour. No, 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 not today. <laughs> okay, okay. No, Jonathan's back. Let's I'm back. get Great. it going 20, again. 20 uh, not, let, let's get that screen much, there. So, so uh, share. All right, let's there. share your screen. Let's get us there. Let's get going. Okay, how's that? Are you seeing that? We got you now. We start. We're good to go. Uh, Thank you. Seeing it, yeah. And then oh, just great. present that from the beginning. And we're going to make you. We're going to try and make that full screen for everyone. It's no? full screen. It's full I just screen did here. The absolute opposite. Sorry, everyone. This is. It will be. It will be on here. Right. You're good to go. All right. Okay. I have full screen. I hope everyone else does too. Yeah. So this talk is, is billed as uh, trees in N scale, but as you'll see that um, actually some of the trees are, are a fair size and can be, um, would, would apply for HO, probably not for O scale, but for HO and, and you know, one or two slightly larger scales perhaps. Anyway, um, the picture you see that the, is the uh, east portal of Cascade Tunnel. For those of you who are familiar with the Great Northern, if you just um, indulge me a little bit as I um, just introduce this area to those who perhaps don't know it. Um, the Great Northern uh, was a very successful railway that ran um, from, uh, well, still does as part of Burlington Northern Santa Fe, of course, runs all the way across to Seattle. And uh, they, had the, they had the knack of building chunks of their line just at the most economically propitious times. Uh, never went bankrupt and never relied on federal uh, railroad grants. Um, and the, the two big, what was it called, the Pacific Extension, they built across into to Spokane and then very quickly in the 1890s built across the mountains to uh, Puget Sound. And that involved going over the Cascades, of course. The first line of the Cascades involved um, perilous switchbacks up to about four and a half thousand feet. Um, and of course, as we know, it's a very wet area. There's a great deal of snow. So by 1900, they built the first Cascade Tunnel, two miles long at a height of uh, three and a half thousand feet above sea level. And it was um, electrified because of the difficulty of getting steam engines through a, a relatively long tunnel. Um, and uh, the problem, they had a number of problems with, with, with getting up to the tunnel, um, particularly going through very heavily snowy mountains. In 1910, there was a terrible disaster uh, where aval uh, two trains were destroyed by avalanches. One had been backed into the tunnel partly to try and keep it safe. But of course, then there were problems with air. Anyway, there, there was a terrible disaster, bad enough that they changed the location of the town from Wellington to Tai um, to, to try and pretend it, it wasn't still there. Anyway, this, this um, meant that they had to you know, really find a solution to this. And it took a while because of World War I and all the rest. By 1925, they'd resolved to build the new Cascade Tunnel further down the mountain at a height of 2,880 feet, uh, much less high and with much less trackage and particularly much less curved trackage. And it was much more easily maintained. And they finished it, as the slide said, just in time before the <laughs> 1929 crash and depression. This image you see is of the West Portal. And you can see the two service tracks that go through. The only one railway track runs through. There was always a also a pioneer tunnel to the right that the other track leads to. In the next slide, we see the East Portal at Burn, Washington. Already you can see that it's a very heavily forested area, a great deal of timber that they could use for construction, um, possibly deforestating, de deforesting the, um, 
the hills above Wellington was partly what caused the severe avalanche because there just weren't so many trees to stop the snow and hold it in place. Um, it's very temperate, this area, very temperate rainforest, as, as we know, those who live there will be smiling wryly to themselves <laughs> as I speak. Uh, interesting, when I, was, when I was at school, I remember doing a, a climate study of the difference between Seattle and Kamloops in British Columbia, and of course the, the effect of rain shadow where most of the rain had already fallen before it reached reaches Kamloops, and so the, there's much, much drier climate there. Uh, these, these small temporary towns that you can see in the picture were built to house and, and cater for the workers building the line. I suspect this being the Prohibition area, there was a fair amount of moonshine being uh, brewed in the, uh, distilled in, in the woods around as well. Um, again, the initial time the line was first run, uh, they extended the electric district from just a few miles at the very top of the mountain to 70 miles under wire from Skykomish um, to about 12, 15 miles to the west of the tunnel, down, all the way down the Tumwater and, and uh, River down to uh, Wenatchee on the Columbia uh, through the Cascade Tunnel and then, then built new locomotives, one of which you see in the picture. This train, by the way, is the Cascadian, which was a day passenger train that ran from Spokane to Seattle in both directions and took about eight or nine hours to get there and ran until the 1950s. And this is one of the, the, the electrics, 1920s electrics that they built to cater for that. You can see again, the kind of countryside we're talking about. I mean, me as an enthusiasm, enthusiast for the Scottish mountains, it looks very, very familiar with the, the rank, serried ranks of, of pine and fir trees reaching high up on to the mountainside. Um, just as a matter of interest, the second car in the train is a boiler car, um, which electrically powered from the locomotive, because of course the steam locomotives weren't there to generate the, the head end steam power for the cars. An interesting model to build. The, so the diesel trains operated as far as Skykomish from the west and then from Wenatchee further on to the east. And this is a, a, I put this slide up just to show the beauty of the, the Great Northern Scheme running in the Cascade Mountains. This is Mount Index to the left, I believe. Um, this is further down the mountain toward the west near, near Index. Apparently, the, I haven't been able to find out exactly who designed the, the color scheme. It was done by a, a publicity marketing firm, I think in Minneapolis. And, but the, allegedly, this, the, the two colors represent the, uh, the, 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 the wheat, the orange is the wheat of the prairies and the green is the forest. Of the Cascades with gold for to separate the two colours. Those lo these locomotives, the E7s, um, proved to be notoriously unreliable in the mountains. They were just too highly geared, and they only ran. Uh, this this is a publicity shot from 1947. They only ran for a year or two. They tried even hooking them up with B unit, uh, F unit B diesels in between to give them a bit more power, but they they just couldn't cope with it. The motors would overheat, and eventually they they ran them with converted F units from then on. Right. In 1956, they did various studies um, and concluded that they should take the wire down and run the diesel through the tunnel. That required ventilating the tunnel. Uh, it's a 7.8 mile long tunnel. It was one of the longest in the world for, it was the longest in the world, I think, certainly in the Western Hemisphere for, for a number of years. Um, and they had to put in a, a, a pumping system that ventilates the tunnel with, um, with fresh air, which is, still runs to this day. There's also a shaft up the mountain, halfway along the tunnel, and a door that closes. When a train is gonna come into the tunnel eastbound, which is the upgrade, the door would shut, and basically the tunnel becomes like an enormous hydraulic ram pressing um, fresh air past the train and just opens just before the, the eastbound train exits. You can see in this watercolor that the artist has represented the smoke from the diesels working hard coming up um, and, and out of the tunnel. It can take quite a while to close. So the, this, this, this tunnel is still a bottleneck on the BNSF system to this day. And th this is a couple of pictures of the uh, East Portal between 1956 and about 2000. The main picture shows the, the pumping nacelles on the left, the black um, steel forms facing into the, the tunnel. And this is, this is the way that in this particular scene, this is what I'm seeking to model. You can see the headlight of the train coming through. The smaller inset picture is what it looks like today. They've erected this rather grotesque 
framework over the uh, over the pumping machinery so that they can be lifted out and taken laid, laid on trucks up on Stevens Pass Highway just above and behind the tunnel there uh, for, to take them away for servicing. Uh, uh, but the so the main picture there on the right is the way that that I prefer to see it. Um, and here is a picture that I took when I visited on my only visit to um, Washington so far uh, in summer 1993. This is at Bern. Washington, and here, you know, getting on now, getting on to the subject of making the trees, um, you can see the way that this is quite a well-known um, scene to great northern fans with the, the, the famous, the scree coming down just behind there. The, the highway runs just above and behind the tunnel portal, and then there's a variety of different trees, little electrical station there, substation to the left. And this uh, here is my model of the Cascade Tunnel. East Portal. Um, the, the the sign on it, by the way, is taken from a photo uh, from a, directly of the of, of the mountain itself. When it came to modelling trees, um, obviously, if you're going to model any area like like the Cascade Tunnel, it needs a great many trees. And um, I was very struck when I began modelling back in the 1980s. I had a copy of this book. Dave Frary's Realistic Model Railroad Scenery. It's now on its third edition uh, and is about three times, about at least twice as thick as it was then. This is the original copy, uh, my original copy. And Dave Frary refers to this, uh, the little picture there on the left, this weed, a stilby arensii, also called Fulspirea, as a widespread perennial. Interestingly, he calls it a weed. In this country, it's a garden plant that is quite, um, quite popular. And um, I mentioned them to uh, our head gardener, alias Mrs. Small, who said, oh, yes, I know those. We can, we can get those. And um, she rather likes them because, as she puts it, nothing eats them. Um, and that includes, for those of you in the US, that includes rabbits and even deer. They're apparently quite unpalatable. <laughs> but they do produce every year these flowers, which, uh, as you'll see, which can be uh, dried. And as David, Dave said, you know, just spray with dilute medium and coat with um, scenic material. Now, basically, the, the whole technique I've, I'm going to show to you here is is this just basically what he suggested, but kind of scaled up. Um, not far from where I live, up in the Lake District, I live on Wirral, which is just near Liverpool. This is in Liverpool. A couple of hours away is, is the Lake District, Windermere, and this garden, Holherd Gardens, is uh, they have the national collection of these plants called the Stilby. And this picture I took actually earlier, just earlier this week, uh, of the stilbies in flower. I'd never been at this time of year to see them all. And as you can see in the picture, a variety of colors from white to pink to red. Um, they're really quite attractive. But all of this foliage comes up and goes down every year with it being perennial. Um, and the, the different species, there are many, many different species, produce quite different shaped flowers, which can produce different species of trees, if, if you like. Um, that's the, another picture of the whole bed. Um, and they fade to a sort of brown, uh, dried out brown by the autumn, uh, by in which time that you can um, harvest them. Um, moving on. Now this is our garden. This is a couple of years ago. Um, in the distance there, there's, there's several pink spears of, of the astilbes growing. And quite a few more today. And that's a little bit closer up. So you see how they grow. Um, the ones at the bottom are, are, are fully fledged and, the, and the, the, the growth seems to go all the way to the top and eventually become quite, quite feathery. Um, sometimes they can be slightly bent, but it is possible to straighten them out unless they're really very stubbornly bent, in which case they just break, of course. But each of these spears are potentially, as you can see, if you can imagine each of the little pink spears is a, is a couple of inches long, it could potentially produce a, a reasonable tree when they're dried out. That's another variety in the garden which has a slightly different shape. Um, they seem to fall into two types. There's the Stilbia rensii and the Stilbia chinensis. These ones that you see on the screen now are chinensis. They have the longer, more spear-like flowers. The um, rensii ones are more sort of like deciduous tree shaped. I use both, um, which make, as I'll show you later, they make quite interesting different shaped, uh, different shaped trees. 
So we cut these in the autumn and uh, this is in my garage. I hang them upside down to dry and it keeps them safe um, and keeps them straight. And uh, as um, Head Gardener says, it's very similar to the way that you dry lavender. This, this was a quite a big stock that I built up. I have to say now the strings are empty with lockdown. I've been able to get through quite a lot of the trees. And when we're ready, uh, that, that's a typical dried astilbe sphere. It's an N-scale boxcar for, for scale. Um, now you might think, well, that the section at the top near the boxcar, that's quite obviously going to make quite a decent looking tree. But actually that particular sphere, I cut into, what is that, 14 um, potential trees. The ones on the top are perhaps the best and the straightest. The ones lower down, a little bit smaller, one or two slightly curved. The one on the right was taken from, if I just go back up one slide, was taken from probably, uh, I can't remember now, but exactly, but it would have been taken from probably the bottom third of that stem, but trimmed to shape. And it's not as beautiful as say the, the, the third one from the left on the top row, but in the middle of a forest, it will do its job and say, I am a tree, which is all we need it to do. Now the tree kitchen, what do we need? Um, well, you can see in the picture, the, the, my, my sort of assembly line. The, the white glue is just what we call in the UK PVA. I believe you use the same term in North America. Um, diluted with water, about one to three, and a few drops of wetting agent. Um, there's very different types. I, I actually invested in a bottle of photographic wetting agent, which doesn't foam in the way that say um, detergent does. Um, and it, it's absolutely vital for scenery building because it, it makes the water soak in without boiling up and it's quite extraordinary the difference it makes. Um, I'm sure mo most of you will know that but if anyone who doesn't, if you're having problems getting your soaking your scenery and getting um, your, your glue to flow in, th this is the answer, is, 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 is a good wetting agent. Um, I've, I've experimented with various different ways of doing this. Um, you know, Dave Frary says, spray it with PVA. Well, I tried that, but all that happened was I finished up with soaking wet newspaper and only a few slightly damp trees. <laughs> um, then I tried having a bowl to catch it and then eventually, you know, not being the most, the, the, most, uh, the quickest on the uptake, I guess, I, I figured out eventually that this method of dipping them into the uh, white glue was gonna be much quicker. But the flowers are slightly fragile. Um, they, they will bend and they, they can break obviously, because they, they, they dry, but once they've been treated in the glue, they really become quite solid. Um, and, uh, you know, once planted on the scenery, and as long as one is careful, they're, they're fairly robust. You know, you can accidentally brush them with your hand and they'll be okay. If you hit them very hard, of course, you, you damage them, but uh, they, they do hold together very well. Um, as I say, radio podcast or CD player is advisable. Um, I usually work for about an hour, and I can make about 100. If I've already cut the trees, I can make about 100, 150 trees in that time. Uh, if I have to cut them as well, it's, it's probably about half that. So I tend to divide the jobs up. Um, so the trees are dipped into the, the white glue. And then um, I spoon over the, 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 the scenery material and pop the, pop the damp soaked trees into the little uh, tray to the, to the left there. And eventually when I've done uh, you can see that in the little dish, there's some trees ready that have been dipped and, and are soaking. I also um, collect with a pipette, which I think is in the picture there, yes. I collect the, the, the runoff from the trees in that little glass dish and return it to the jar. So that I, it's, of course, it's not that expensive, but it's good not to waste the stuff. Plus, we don't want the trees to have too much glue on them because then when we hang them up to dry, uh, if they are very, very wet, then the glue will soak down to the bottom and produce a rather bulbous tip, which we don't want. I mean, end scale trees ought to have very pointed tips. It's difficult enough, or model coniferous trees in any scale. Um, it's difficult enough to get them sharp enough without um, having this, this effect. So making sure that we collect and remove uh, excess glue before um, coating them and hanging them up. Here's a, this picture, you can see my, my drying rack. It's just a brass rod with miniature, there's a miniature doll's house type clothes pegs about an inch long. Um, and they, uh, they, you know, 12 hours and they're, they're, they're dry enough to, to, to use. Um, it's an overall sort of shot. There's a couple of trays of, of completed trees all ready to go on the layout, M more to be worked on on the bench. Um, seen at the tree factory. 
And then just a reminder what we're looking for, I guess this is more Stephen's past tourist, uh, tourist attractive pictures. So the trees, tall trees by the track and by the river and up into the mountains with the train, of course. So this was my first attempt at East Portal. Now, it, it, uh, as you can see um, on, my, on the upper deck of my layout, um, the, uh, I added the upper deck about eight to 10 years after I built the original part of the layout. And um, this area at, was my first, I guess it was probably done slightly quickly because um, I was trying to finish quite a large area of scenery. The trees you see there, they faded a bit because they, by the time I took this picture, they'd been there quite a long time. I'd rather abandon the, the effort because I wasn't actually that happy with it. I mean, so sometimes it's good to see things that don't work and then see how they do work when we do them better. These were far too tall in my view, although they might be the height of some real trees. In, on the model, I just think they look better if they're not too tall, um, perhaps twice the height of the trains, not too much more than that. And uh, also because with the proportion of the, the size of the twig, the trunk looks too spindly and thin. Also, this uh, slope was far too steep. So that's the area that I decided to do a makeover. And here we go. Uh, this was beginning about 2013. I managed to salvage some of the slope, added the highway, which was missing on the previous model, um, and extended the scene. We have Nason Creek, which flows outside the tunnel there as well. And this is the area um, ready for forest planting. You can see I've, I've made the scree with uh, plaster of Paris rock pieces carefully graded and, and glued in place. Uh, the, 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 the highway disappears behind the hill and I've painted the backdrop with very similar colors that you'll see on the trees so that um, you know the tree blends into the scenery which is what we were always trying to the effect we're always trying to achieve. Starting to plant the trees. The, these are, as the, the caption says only an inch an inch and a half high um, and the stumps you see there are were on that section of, of, of hill that was already there. So I start to plant them, you know, as close, really about as close together as they'll go, but the trees in front will fill in the gap. So, you know, they, they need to be, in my experience, fairly closely packed, but, you know, not crammed together and try to get a natural effect. The same stand of trees. Um, Moving on. By the way, you can see in that picture how high and close it is to the ceiling. That's the ceiling of a dormer window in the room at the top of the house here. That fluorescent lamp tube, um, I've learned to my to some degree of cost that the fluorescent tubes, of course, produce a good deal of your ultraviolet, which can fade our scenery. I've recently uh, replaced all, well, I had several tubes up there and I've replaced them all with flat LED panels, uh, which produce much less, if not almost no no ultraviolet and hopefully we'll see the effect. I also use uh, daylight blinds to keep natural UV out of the room as much as possible. There are remedies to that but it's nice not to have to uh, resort to that too too quickly. Here we see the next rows of trees put in place, still starting with the small ones at the back and working forwards. And some more pictures around the scene. So there we see that the forest on the right is pretty much done above the mountainside mock-up cobbled mock-up building there on the, in front of the tunnel that area is still under construction um, an earlier picture bottom left obviously and further along the ridge to the left of, of the other two pictures an area that i've started planting uh, along the ridge of, of burn the, you can see mount index on the on the backdrop poking over the, the picture underneath the clock there that's on the far side of the layout which won't feature very much in this uh, in, in this talk just today And uh, day and night shots uh, just near the near the tunnel portal. Um, and you know we we put some I, I put some of the better tree specimens near the front where they'll be seen, uh, where where people might you know notice that they're actually quite nice models. Um, as I said earlier, in, in once they're in the middle of the forest, they you know doesn't matter really. You can just so long as it says I am a tree, that's all you need. But nearer the front, we want trees that look 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 nice. Hopefully you can see in the right hand picture the resemblance uh, between the, the structures at Cascade Tunnel and the ones that I've modeled. A um, few more pictures here. There's the, on the right, there's the little electrical substation with the forest behind it. Um, 
bottom center that's a, a freight train exiting the tunnel and coming around the track i've tried with my models of both of the the tunnel portals the, the layout isn't um prototypical in every aspect there are quite a bit of imaginary things on it although i use the place names but there are some locations i've tried to model as accurately as possible and and the two tunnel portals in particular um you, uh, hopefully you can see the resemblance And this is the West Portal. Um, the uh, steep cliff there dropping down to the lower level, that, that's a little technique, a modeling style, I guess, in partly in tribute to Cliff Young and his Denver and Rio Grande, um, the, 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 my headmaster's layout that I've, I've visited when I was uh, at school. And he, uh, his scenery was, was very beautifully done, but actually it was literally all vertical. It was almost all vertical hardboard with um, with, with plaster scraped on it to make it look like a rock surface. And it, it worked remarkably well. And um, that's a way to achieve separation in a small space. Um, this particular corner where you see the tracks are indexed with all the tools lying on it, um, it, it's a little tight there. And so this was my solution to the problem was just to, to, to drop, literally drop the, drop the landscape off a cliff and, and tuck the West Portal in above that. The backdrop painted to represent um, Cowboy Mountain uh, which is there in the Cascades. And as you see the right-hand picture, I've, I've built a proper bridge uh, and started to do some scenic treatment of the creek and uh, added trees above the tunnel portal. Um, above that, the little uh, yellow lines, that's a little control panel for the turnouts on the upper deck. So you just see this tucks in. Um, from this tunnel, there's a five-turn helix, as it says on the caption, that, that rises up to the upper deck. The upper deck on the layout takes the form of um, a return loop. So you come out at Burn, it goes all the way around to an area called Winton, which in reality is um, you know 20 miles to the uh, east of Cascade Tunnel. You go into the Winton Tunnel, and then in the helix, there's a, there's a turnout that joins the whole thing back together and you come back down again. And these are scenes at West Portal. Bottom left is, is of course, the real, real West Portal. Uh, the notches, uh, in, they're not cracks in the, um, in, in the tunnel portal. That's, that's where they literally, they literally cut that shape through the entire eight miles of the tunnels. They could get double stacks through in the 19, I guess in the, in the 70s. Um, it must have been quite a job. And that's my model representing it. And then looking the other way towards Scenic, the, the track layout at Scenic is the same as in the real place uh, with a long passing siding and then a shorter one as well. And with, with the forest up behind it, the, the, the depot is not in the uh, correct place. The depot should be to the right of the main line, but there, unfortunately on my layout, there's a, another cliff dropping down to uh, another track. So I've relocated it across the track mm. there. And now with a few more, yes, yeah, so and now with a few more trees and a few scenes, um, just to say that the light leaks on, on, on the bottom right picture have now been fixed. <laughs> and th this area was perhaps one of the first th that I completed to this, th this level with the, the trees and with the forest that closely packed. And I was very, very pleased with the effect. I mean, it, it, I'll just go back up. Um, of slides the, the difference is really quite dramatic and um the scene those the scenic texture there was once you know grass green but it faded but actually it makes not a bad um sub forest floor color so i left it the way it was and then just added the trees and some scenic treatment to the front uh where obviously you know daylight penetrates more easily um to allow for other vegetation vegetation to grow uh, the bottom left picture, actually, that you see the, the white, those trees look like they've just been planted. The white glue is still white. It hasn't even dried yet. Um, now back up to the upper deck. Um, this is the bottom right picture is the ridge further along. Cascade Tunnel is way over to the right. And then you see the track curving around in this, this big return loop. Uh, there's a location to the east of Burn known as Gainer, probably named for somebody's wife in the 1890s. And um, here I've added uh, this is a panorama that shows the effect of, of, of a large planting of trees. Um, I hope you won't mind my saying I'm quite pleased with that effect. <laughs> and a, a few 19, lovely 1960s Jeeps to, to give the feeling of weight. This, this area is actually at about eye height, so the, the N-scale trains look 
much they look very very good at that height you know normally we see them from when they're much lower down and this is the area before and after again here we see on the bottom left the old trees uh, where they were a bit too big and not planted closely together enough and um, and they faded of course probably thanks to the two strip light tubes um, all of those are recycled the tall ones that were sort of four or five inches, you can, I could take them out, cut, just cut them at the bottom, snip them into, reshape them slightly and retreat them. And they were all reused on the scene that you see uh, on the right. And there you can see the upper deck with all the trees uh, leading all the way down to the Cascade Tunnel portal at the, at the far end. That's a distance of about 10 to 12 feet, maybe, maybe a bit more actually. That's probably a bit more anyway. But it leads down. Oh, and I think I've left my instrument out to air after a practice session on the bench just to the right. <laughs> So this is right up near the ceiling on the upper deck. And then coming round to the other side of that mountain. The mountain, by the way, it's a little bit on the ugly side, but it, it serves a purpose. Let me just go back one again. Yes, it, it serves a purpose. Um, out, out of the top of it come a couple of wooden uh, slats, which I always try to manage not to take photos of, but they, they basically hold the thing up. It, it uh, attaches the upper deck to the ceiling uh, so that the thing doesn't rock when you if you bump against it and 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 damage things, it's it's firmly secured. I built the mountain around it to kind of hide that. And then this was last summer, um, showing how you know adding building the trees all the way around the uh, mountain with a few rocks that have presumably fallen down sometime in in the past. Uh, top on the top picture to the left, you can see the line curving all the way around through an area called Merritt. Uh, yet under construction, down to the far end where I've built a representation of the Winton sawmill, which until oh, a few years ago was about the only actual working customer on the Cascade line. It was, um, well, a sawmill, uh, it was quite a big one, and it used to have local freight trains that would come there every day. So I have an operation on my line to run um, timber from one location up to the sawmill and then saw wood products going in all sorts of different directions. And this actually, this is a lockdown project. This is work that I've done in the last, just the last uh, four to six weeks. White Pine Road, um, again, a real location that does run, uh, does go nearby the, the line between Burn and Merritt. Uh, and I've added Nason Creek and a couple of bridges across it. And with, with the idea of, um, you know, just a, a place to really view the tree trains running through beautiful scenery. I've added that little wooden house there. That's from a, um, a laser cut kit. And the, the, the little bridge, those of you who've ever read the uh, wonderful book on N-scale modeling from the 70s by Gordon Odegaard on modeling the Clinchfield might recognize it. Uh, he built a beautiful little bridge, um, footbridge, and I, I just wanted to do it in tribute to him. I'm afraid mine isn't as neat and straight as his was, but I may, may have another go at it. But I just wanted to add that as a little feature. So here we can see the, the effect of, I was very pleased with the, the shadow effect on the road by adding the trees and like sunlight, dappled sunlight coming through the trees. And on the right, on the right picture, carefully planting those trees in the depression there. Uh, and then, you know, when, when you plant trees on the outside, one has to be careful that one can still reach the track for cleaning and, and other details and for operation and can still, still see the train. So, there's a good deal of peering and looking and holding model trees in place and looking where you see where you think they should go. Uh, and approaching Merritt, this is the same location, just a couple of other pictures. Um, the effect of the, the trees around the house with telegraph poles, those look like they've just been glued in place too. And uh, then a picture I actually took, the bottom right picture I just took this morning because I wasn't happy with the ones I had before uh, of the creek coming down uh, under the bridges there. And um, again, before and after pictures at, at, on the other side at Merritt itself. I think I've probably explained everything there is to see here. The structures, the, the ghastly Bachman water tower, which is, uh, if you look on the bottom picture, you'll see I've cut it down and, and, and painted it a better colour. And uh, there was a beautiful enormous water tower at Merritt actually in the Great Northern Historical Society has even put out a, a, a reference sheet 
on uh, on how uh, with photos of it in place um my the space here isn't sufficient to model merit as it actually was there there was a y and uh it's still there actually there was there's a y and and you know much more extensive but i've done done my best to add some suitable looking um work houses uh, you know workmen's houses and the the two structures there the little depot and the tool building they are there and modeled on 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 the prototype things the water tower is no longer there but i wanted to have it anyway there'll be another structure in between the, the houses and the, the depot and again the effect of bringing the forest it's interesting how it darkens the scenery as you can see that the, the color is much darker and um more foreboding perhaps which is the way it should be and there the train is the cask my model of the cascadian um had to make some of the cars a little heater car there behind the fts and the cut down um storage mail car and a 60 foot rpo those are and two recycled heavyweight cars and then a cafe lounge car at the rear that was the cast that was the consist that they ran on that train pretty much all the way through actually and certainly post-war until it till it was taken off in the 50s just another picture of the same scene um Mount Bearing on the far side is on the far side of the layout. So as a gardener's term, borrowed scenery, where you you can look at your garden with somebody else's scenery in the distance. And any um, layout in the Pacific Northwest would not be complete without Bigfoot. Um, though I have found that getting reliable uh, prototype. Um, photos and information is tricky to say the least but there we are so that's my clinic on making trees for the pacific northwoods i hope you've enjoyed it and i'd be delighted to answer any questions that you may have over to you thanks very much jonathan you just uh stopped your screen sharing right now we do have some questions uh for the chat uh uh, we'll put forward to you now. Uh, a number of people comment on how well uh, your scenes look, and uh, that uh, they, they, it's really well done. So, thank you. Uh, a few comments like that. Uh, one person uh, made a comment that you talked about your plants being uh, crooked or bent. Uh, he says you can make them straight using a soldering iron, lightly applied to the outside of the trunk to uh, strengthen. Uh, so, I uh, did, did somebody, somebody suggested that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That that's good. Thank yeah. you for that. Yeah. And then uh, same person uh, says you can dust the top with a yellow rattle can to create some dimension artificial light source. Yeah. Uh, you had a picture of your station with light leaks. Somebody wants yeah. to know how did you fix the light leaks? Um, basically, by uh, looking very carefully where they are and using um, uh, black paper on the inside of the structure, just. Uh, I mean, I do try to mask it as best I can, but where <clears throat> sometimes I've used, <clears throat> excuse me, sometimes I cut a black paper mask, which also I use LEDs to light the buildings. Uh, and sometimes uh, I use a black paper mask, which um, also reduces the amount of light bouncing around inside the building. Um, because even, even when you reduce the LEDs down to running them at three volts instead of 12, they can still look very, very bright much brighter than, you know, normal incandescent lights would look being seen from the outside. So, so that helps to reduce the amount of light um, bouncing around. Sometimes I use, use card, um, just whatever's to hand. <clears throat> a few tricky places like the corners along roof lines, I've used um, putty, green modeling putty, just to press in and, and just to take up those, those, those little shapes. So basically whatever you can to fill the holes. Yeah, thing. whatever it needs, whatever All it right. takes. I mean, uh, paint, always do it unfortunately it does need to be yeah. something with a bit of thickness to it yes uh somebody has the question uh working from uk what resources did you use for researching the railroad oh my well when i started in in, in the 1980s there wasn't that much um there were there were some um uh, specialist articles on on the consists of, of the empire builder and stuff um and and i had a Charles, Chuck Wood's book on the Great Northern Lines West, which my father-in-law had a copy of, which I, I used to devour, full of black and white photos, mostly of locomotives, but you could see a good deal of the country around as well. 
Um, but now today, it, it, it's so easy. I mean, not only are there multiple series of color pictorials by different authors and different publishers, there's a seven volume um, by one you know, great northern pictorial showing just about, I think the, there can't be many square inches of the, of the railway and its equipment that haven't been photographed and published in these fantastic books. Um, but I am a member of the GNRHS. I've been a member of that almost as long as the NMRA. And I have um, 30 years worth of reference sheets and um, articles, you know, technical articles written by fantastic enthusiasts uh, all over the, the, the area who, who followed it. You know, that, that started out as probably a lot of these railroad historical societies did as, uh, as an association of uh, former employees. It originally had the, the title of the Fraternal, Fraternal Brotherhood of Empire Builders, I think it was called. Well, those two words mean the same thing. Uh, but um, and, and then grew into the GNRHS, and I, I became a member of that. And they send out wonderful reference sheets, you know, on, on everything from Anodyna's outhouses in Montana along the track to the details of signaling to bridges here and there to depots to, you know, the, the, the pumping systems of certain passenger cars to, to you know, a lot of the, the the big subjects were done early on, so that was a great source of of information, you know, on on track plans and and, and anything you you can imagine, really. Yeah, and, no, and, I, and I and I suppose these days uh, things like uh, uh, Facebook groups or email groups, that type of thing, they're a wonderful source because there's all sorts of people out there who know something oh, yeah. that you're looking for. We'll have it, the information for you. Well, I managed to go in, in 1993. I went with my late father-in-law, who was a railway enthusiast, as, as I was saying earlier. Um, and I actually, literally, I wrote letters, never mind email and Facebook. You know, this is this is in the pre-social media days. I actually wrote air le airmail letters to all the members of the GNRHS who lived in the Cascade area. And I said, I'm going to come on the Empire Builder. Would love to visit the area. You know, any chance to meet up? And could you tell us anything? And I had a couple of very positive replies and one couple invited us and hosted us for several days at their cabin in Skykomish and took us all over the mountains and their friends in the town through a party, uh, a, a wonderful barbecue. And, and we had the most wonderful tour and it was an experience I'll never forget. They, they, I think they may have may no longer be with us because they were retired and this was like 30 odd years ago. Uh, but it was a wonderful visit and great opportunity to do some field work and just get the lie of the land, you know. And we should all do that if we have the opportunity to visit, visit yeah. our favorite place. Yeah, absolutely, you can. Uh, somebody uh, commented in question, uh, very impressive finding a plant that passes wren scale trees. <laughs> How many trees are you able to make using a season's worth of plants? And then somebody else uh, wants to know how many trees have you got on the layout and do you ever have tree making parties? <laughs> I'd love to. Um, actually, my, my, my oldest son and his, his fiance uh, spent some merry um, days uh, when they were on holiday with us last year planting trees. Some of the, some of the, the, the forest that you see was planted by Michael and Annalise up near Winton, particularly. Um, as to how many you can get it, well, it kind of depends how many you grow. Um, and um, we have, I have several plantings uh, out here, but I must say during lockdown, I've got through so many of them because I've just had time. Uh, and I built up quite a stock, as you saw, hanging in the garage there. Uh, and and I've, I've nearly run out, so I'm going to have to wait till, till this year. As to how many on the layout, well, I think there must be thousands. So it's, it, it, it's a veritable forest of trees, is what you're saying. Oh, it really is. Uh, it, it, it's uh, yeah, it, it's a uh, it's a labor of love. I mean, it, it's one of those things that you know wasn't built in a day. It, it, it's taken time. But actually, all of the trees you see on that upper deck, the, the vast majority of them have been planted in the last twelve months. Okay. Um, um, that's that. We've got to bear in mind this is during the lockdown period where there has yeah, been. Yeah. So you, you haven't you haven't had much else uh, to do. So yeah productivity went way up yeah, how long how long does it make you to uh take you to make a tree um well you, you don't do one on its own um you know they uh i've, I've got a few here I can, I can hold up to camera i mean this this is a fairly large one um it's about you know the the the, the, the uh foliage part of it is about about two and a half inches um, tall. That that's a that would be a decent sized tree in in HO. That's one of the larger ones. Um, how long to make it? Well, you've got to got to cut it. You've got to shape it a little bit. Then you've got to 
dip it in the glue and make sure it's wet and then dust it and let it dry. It, it's moments. It, it's for each tree. It's it's really very little time at all. But of course, we need a great many trees. So a couple I mean, minutes a tree type thing, there, if that. Oh, even less. Probably okay. even less. Even less. And uh, how long does it take you to dry your plants once you harvest them? They'd be fairly dry when you start, but obviously you got to make them totally dry. And do you have any uh, concerns with insects uh, in the plants? Um, no. Well, yeah. The, I, I actually, <laughs> I have. Uh, I did once find a found a, a brown and yellow garden spider had made a home in, on in one of my um, model towns, and I had to sort of shepherd it back outside again. It had literally come in on all the stilbies. But that's that's the only time that the, the, there are no critters on them. Hanging them outside to dry helps. Yeah, and, and I don't leave them. They, they're fairly dry when you harvest them in the autumn. Then hang them in the garage over winter, you know, and then they're, 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 you know you can kind of feel when they're dry. Okay, uh, that plant would it be suitable if you got gets large enough ones to go HO scale on them? I would say so. Yeah, I mean you wouldn't get quite so many from each stem, but yeah, you know you can get. I mean, as I say, that that would be a decent a decent HO scale tree. Yeah, I mean the, right. the point about this is is that it it's you know it, you can't afford to buy. There are wonderful model trees available from, I mean, many outlets. We have a, a, a store here in this country, model tree shop, Alan Bird, an NMRA member, runs his own business, sells wonderful model trees for all scales. But these are these are specialist pieces to put at the front of the layout where they're going to be seen or, or in small amounts. You couldn't possibly um, afford, and well, I, you know, I suppose some people could, but, you know, I certainly couldn't afford to forest your entire layout with, with those kinds of trees these these well for one thing once you've planted the plants they're free they come up every year uh, you're talking about cents worth of, of um, uh, scenic material and a bit of glue and that's it you know okay uh, just one final comment from the chat somebody says uh, there's a live stream of the Skykomish area 24 7 you want to look at the mountains of the area so you yeah get there whenever whenever I, I sometimes put that on on on, on our smart tv and my wife says oh no not watching rain falling in sky Comish again <laughs> <laughs> they do get a bit they do get a bit of that don't they and the, oh, and the snow too the snow yeah, the snow. snow yes sir yeah. yes sir all right well thank you very much jonathan a very okay. good clinic uh certainly enjoyed it here the uh, people watching enjoyed it uh we appreciate taking the time and shuffling your schedule around to accommodate our technical uh -huh. difficulties and uh again thanks a lot and we'll hope to see you somewhere later with another clinic it's my pleasure. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for your attention.